Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women as ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is a public intellectual, a Renaissance man, a philosopher, author, a columnist. He did an undergraduate degree in philosophy and politics at Harvard University, went on to study business management and has left behind at least three case studies used by the Harvard Business School. He returned to India, spent 30 years from being a bicycle salesman to the CEO of Procter & Gamble, uh, a job he gave up to become a writer. He's written several books, three plays that have been performed around the world and have been published as an anthology by the Oxford University Press. His most recent books have included The Elephant Paradigm and India Unbound, which have both been published by Penguin and have been international bestsellers. He's got a uh, novel, A Fine Family, which is to be made uh, into a film by Sean Benegal, as you can see, A Man of Many Parts. As a columnist, he writes for the Times of India and occasionally for the Wall Street Journal. I'm delighted to finally get down to introducing my guest in person, <laughs> Guru Charan Das. Uh, Guru Charan Das, the guru. You sort of derive your name from that, and, and, and uh, you, know, you, 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 hear, you, you wear the hat of a public intellectual writing for the community and the group. What is your own sense of a, of, of, of a guru for you? Well, you know, I must <laughs> tell you that the name guru uh, uh, I, my name when I was, uh, when I was young was Ashok Kumar and uh, my grandmother though did not think, uh, she suspected that my mother gave me that name because she was in love with the actor Ashok okay. Kumar. So she didn't think that was an appropriate <laughs> name for her grandson. So she took me to her guru, put me at his feet and told the guru, Enu Nadio. And so the guru looked at down and he says, well, since you've put him at my feet, let's call him Guru Charan Das. So, the, so was, was that when the sort of the seeds of this role that you see yourself now as, you know, sort of philosopher, intellectual, writing for the community <laughs> sort of come up? <laughs> well, I think one thing for sure, the guru probably knew that I needed to be reminded every day to be humble. <laughs> and so suddenly from the prince of happiness, I became a very, you know, Ashok Kumar <laughs> to, a, to humble servant of the feet of the guru. But let me tell you my, when I was in the business world, my attitude, my, the word guru, what it meant for me, stood for guru, good at understanding but relatively useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, you use the word good, and I know that you're sort of uh, working to you know, deliver a lecture on uh, why be good. And, and this really derives from, you know, one, one of the many things I, I couldn't squeeze into the brief introduction was that you're also working on a book on the Mahabharat. Uh, so, you know, for a, a corporate guru to, to talk about uh, why be good, well, tell us, why be good? <laughs> well. Uh, let me first tell you that uh, how I got into this project. Uh, uh, my sort of basic university work was in two areas. One was moral philosophy, and uh, and this and where I which I studied with Rawls, and the second uh, I also dabbled with uh, in with a great man called Ingalls in Sanskrit and with epic in particular. So I'm kind of returning back to those mm -hmm. uh, college enthusiasms. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of my last book, India Unbound, I concluded, Rajiv, that the prosperity of India now would not, could not be stopped. That we will really turn into a middle class nation. Maybe not as fast as China, but we will surely and certainly there are parts of India which will turn middle class by 2020 and there are parts like Bihar, Eastern UP, Odisha, which will take another generation. In fact, you predicted that this will happen you know, quickly enough for us to overtake Europe too. Well, in <laughs> fact, I think as a, as a whole economy we will because the demographics are against uh, Europe. So what I'm trying to say is that s odd as it may seem and astonishing as it may seem, but the prosperity of India really is on autopilot. And if we do more reforms, we'll do it faster. So at the end of my book, I said the, my feeling that I left with was that now the issue that concerns us all is really governance. 
the fact that teachers don't show up. I mean, 25, one out of four teachers in a government school is absent without a proper reason for being absent. Uh, and two out of four teachers are not teaching. And I said that, look, in such a case, normally we look to institutional reform. You know, if you, sack a te if you could sack a teacher who did not show up, you would have other teachers showing up. Mm -hmm. But even if they showed up, you could not ensure that they would actually teach. So there was a moral dimension. And to understand that moral failure is why I decided to go to the Mahabharat. And for the last three years, I've really been studying, the, believe it or not, <laughs> the Mahabharat. I have uh, spent time with Sanskritists. Uh, I've been reading it, you know, I've, I have the critical, the Pune critical edition, plus I'm using the University of Chicago Press edition mm -hmm. in English because, it, you know, you can't really read it in Sanskrit at this age in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can go to Sanskrit if I want to check a certain word. But tell us about this, this why be good uh, dimension. Do you really believe that the moral imperative to be virtuous yeah. Uh, that aspiration is what will transform society? Well, uh, I think it's, it's, it's necessary. And I think some of this fact that I'm talking about, teachers not showing up in schools and beating children, these dimensions are moral dimensions. And through this book, I really would like to have Indians look in the mirror and face the questions that Yudhishthir and Draupadi face you know, in the Vana uh, Parvan or in the Sabha Parvan as to why you have... I mean, Draupadi is asking Yudhishthir, look, here you are, you are the good fellow, and here you are in the forest, sleeping on the earth, while Duryodhan is sleeping on sheets of silk, on down pillows. And so what's, why, why should you be good? Why not just, why not might is right, as Duryodhan believes? Before we move on, you still haven't told me why one should be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that the answer, the best answer is the answer that Yudhishthir gives. And that is that you have to be good because you have to be good. Now, this sounds odd. But that is really the only justification that when you start giving utilitarian answers or answers about, well, you'll get to heaven if you are good, or if you start giving any extraneous answer that society couldn't function unless you kept promises, you, you know, he says society will collapse if people lie to each other. So you need norms. But ultimately, the most powerful answer he gives is that you have to be good because that's the only way to be. You don't need a justification. It is an imperative. You're watching a conversation with the corporate guru, philosophy, philosopher, uh, writer, columnist, at all, Guru Charandas. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Gurcher and Das. Uh, we were talking about uh, being good, uh, and, 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 and you have been a votary of uh, the private sector, of uh, um, the, the globalization, of the, 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 the role that, that, that the corporates can play. Uh, have, you been, have you struggled? Were you struggling when you were uh, with Procter & Gamble and the private sector yourself with this notion of... Uh, the moral imperative uh, for, for the private sector, was that, was the philosopher in you yearning to get out and be free from the structures of pursuing profit I, for its own sake? Well, that's <laughs> too romantic a, a, an idea. You know, I was just doing my job, frankly. And the one thing, though, it was pretty clear to me from the beginning was that you were, that my salary was not paid by my boss. My salary was paid by the consumer. And so if I was selling Vicks Vaporub, I had to make sure that the label on the bottle was properly put and the ingredients were 
good and fresh. And otherwise, your competitor will to take away the business. And that's the thing about the competitive market, mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about being good. The, comp the competitor ensures that you behave uh, well in the market. If you start cheating, if you start claiming in your advertising things that are not correct, you are driven out by the market. Mm -hmm. um, my concern, obviously, even in the in the private sector, uh, there are things when you 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 know you try people try to cut corners, etc. But one thing was very clear that you had to obey the law. I mean, you couldn't get away without that, and that's the mistake a lot of businessmen make. And seem to get away and survive and, and apparently yeah. thrive. But you know, Rajiv, I've worked in the private sector and I've, of course we all observe the public mm -hmm. domain. And right now in India, it's really what's concerning us is the public domain. The private sector is kind of on its, on its own, you know, it's, it's delivering in it. We're getting growth, we're getting prosperity. Uh, the institutions like SEBI, etc. have improved. What is failing us really is the public domain. And that's where my concerns about right and wrong and good and bad have come because the day, you know, you, I, I, I re took early retirement to become a writer in mid-career. And the, one of the first things we did was to build a house. And you can, you know, building a house at every turn is a nightmare for, a, for the ordinary person. You are asked for a bribe, you're, somebody will put a, a red tape, you know, tie you up in, in red tape. So I just saw the kind of bad behavior I had never seen in the private sector. You see, you don't see it in the private sector because the customer will drive you out. You know, he, he can choose between you and your competitor. So in a sense, this kind of uh, but social engineering of, of becoming good, we talked about it in the first mm -hmm. segment of the program, how is that likely to happen? How is that transformation going to take place? Uh, particularly, uh, you know, there's, uh, the, in, in, in India there is great concern about issues of equity, about the agriculture sector, about the rural sector, about eradicating poverty. That's sort of the buzzword uh, for the government because, as you said, the private sector is sort of taking care of the middle class and, and, and the elites in some ways. But there is this huge, huge, huge segment of India that's getting left behind. Yeah. Do we just wait for the fact or, or that the, the Manmohan Singh is a prime minister, seen as an honest man, a man of integrity, and somehow that will permeate down the system? Well, I think actually, oddly enough, the poor are the biggest victims of bad behavior on the part of government servants. The, the rich get away. But the poor, you see the rickshaw driver, you see the radiwala, and they have to pay a hafta, they have to bribe, and they are the ones who just get caught. And so actually, it's for them, it's the same thing. I mean, if we had the kind of reforms where we gave people titles to what they own, automatically, I mean, this is Hernando de Soto's classic argument that if the poor had title to what they have, whether it's a rickshaw or their ready or a little shop or their piece of land, then they can leverage that. And, and that. So to me, it's really, once again, that markets can help a great deal. And you see, even, even the poor person, when his father dies, he has a little piece of land, but the patwari makes sure that he gets his pound of flesh before he'll transfer that land to So do you person. feel that this change is possible through legislative initiatives by you know, doing things like giving the poor titles? Is, is that enough to... I mean, would you say that you know, in, in countries where uh, you know, the, the private sector or private enterprise dominates, uh, uh, you know, like in, say in the United States, uh, where a lobbyist from the private sector can move in and out of government with great ease, that somehow we get better governance, more moral governance? Uh, 
No, uh, that's that. I, I mean, coming. I mean, I'm really focusing on your f first question, which is really about the poor and how to get them out of it. The answer for the poor, Rajiv, is not to give them dolls, money. Uh, in fact, it's probably better to give them money than to give them these work for food programs, food for work programs, etc. But the real answer for the poor is to make our services work and give them titles, as I said. Now, services work means school. If you can just do schooling and health properly. Yet, ironically, schooling and health are not issues on the political agenda. When, when politicians go for elections, we're not really talking about schools and, and, and health. Why isn't there a demand pull from the electorate for what seems to people like you and me very basic needs? Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing you say this because mm -hmm. once I met Mr. Advani mm -hmm. and he was telling me he went on his Rath Yatra. And I said, Advani ji, what did people tell you? They said they, he said they wanted schools. And I said, well, what did you do about that? And he was silent. And you'd think that today elections should be fought when there's such huge demand for schools. And the fact is, Rajiv, that India now spends 4% on G of G GDP on education. Plus, we are paying this education cess. I don't know what it will total <laughs> up to. But the reality is, it's not the quantity. The left wants us to throw more money. But it's not just the quantity of money. What's betraying us is that school teachers are not showing up in these schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know whether you're familiar with the study that came out mm -hmm. that one out of four teachers is absent. Two out of four teachers are not teaching. This is government primary schools all over India. The best is Maharashtra with 15% absence, and the worst is Bihar and Jharkhand with 41-42% absence. And <coughs> so when you think about it, that if two out of four are not teaching, one out of four is absent, then we are getting only 1% one per one percent of GDP being effective in education, really. 1% out of 110,000 crores. I mean, we are wasting 80,000 crores mm -hmm. from this bad behavior. Mm -hmm. Now, that's where goodness somehow I feel, because who's going to, nobody dares touch the teachers' union, which is, won't let the teachers be touched. Mm -hmm. And certainly, uh, you know, they are the invigilators in the schools. I'm not saying all teachers. I mean, there's are wonderful teachers. Sure. But this is a statistic. We'll come right back in a moment. You're watching a conversation with Good Charandas. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. You're watching a continuing conversation with the social political philosopher Gurcharan Das. We'll be right back. Uh, Gurcharan Das, you were talking about uh, schools, you were talking about education, you were talking about the future of India. Uh, you know, the West, the Economist in particular, has, has long been trying to project India as a sort of, you know, the sleeping tiger. And you have, in fact, used the paradigm of the elephant. Why the elephant? Well, I think that. Uh you know, there are, I mean, democracy and tradition do hold us back. And in, in some ways, I think we are, we are willing to pay that price. I mean, I think we'd like our tradition to continue. Mm -hmm. We'd like democracy to continue. And I don't think at least large parts of India would trade off democracy for 2% higher growth. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me the, two, the people 25% below the poverty line, may be willing to make that trade-off, mm -hmm. and they should. So I think that the fact is that, look, we've been growing at 6% a year for 25 years. Now, this is an elephant that's on the move, an elephant, a formidable elephant. But still, the pace of reform is so slow. But what it's about the painful qualities of the elephant, as opposed to the qualities of the tiger, that 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 sort of well, got, got you to use the, the yeah, image of an you elephant? You see, the the tiger <laughs> runs out of steam. Mm -hmm. The elephant, the tiger may have speed, but the elephant has distance. And 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 so I think that's a 
a good way to characterize. And the elephant meditates, the elephant spends a long time in, in silence. Yes, there's a, famous <laughs> Buddhist, there's a famous Buddhist uh, saying about the elephant who meditates. Uh, I think it's a, it's, it's the elephant is more what we are as Indians. A diverse country like India has to be the way we are. I think that's why, I mean, people have been wondering for two generations, how did India become a democracy? Well, that's the only way India could have survived in, 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 with its diversity. So, I, and you know, when an elephant is also moving the way this one is, you know, with purpose, I, I just think that that's, it's a good, it's a, it's a good image. It's not a negative image. As someone who sort of studied philosophy at Harvard and, and, and you have said in some ways that your, your sort of ideal is, is the ideal of the, you know, of, of the Enlightenment in, in, in a very Western sense. Uh, and you're researching the Mahabharata, you're, you know, you're deeply grounded in Indian tradition, you, you, know, you write about it. Uh, what is the quality of, of Indianness? Uh, th that you feel, uh, that, that you have, even as this, this 18th century enlightenment uh, holds so much attraction for you? Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm seeking that, <laughs> uh, like all of us, and uh, something one has been seeking all one's life, uh, and I'm not sure there's an easy answer. But the, most of us think that it's our obsession with moksha that makes for Indianness, our belief in the transcendence, and belief in the perf sort of human perfection to ab be able to achieve that. My interest, however, is not in moksha. My interest is in dharma. Uh, I think there's we've kind of forgotten in this overlay of moksha that the Indian tradition is very rich in its in what it can offer dharma about dharma and that's really why i mean i'm interested in the using dharma as a way to get try to grasp these failures in governance the day-to-day -day governance that we were just mm -hmm. speaking about and and I, I i kind of think that it's time that not only we but the the west also thinks oh that other worldly country india whereas Frankly, the stuff on dharma is very much this worldly, very much dharma of the king. How the king, you know, in, in Shanti Parvan, the whole Bhishma's sort of teaching to Yudhishthira after the war is about how a king should behave. Which, you know, some people would sort of be uncomfortable and, 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 and think that in, in, in a secular democracy, you know, to talk about the notion of, of, of dharma uh, as, 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 as a dominant aspiration is, is sort of dangerous. Well, it's, it, I think we have actually, de the word dharma has got degenerated. Dharma doesn't mean religion. Dharma means doing the right thing, being moral, doing right and do not doing wrong. Now, we're in democracy, in a secular democracy, can't you talk about right and wrong? This has got nothing to do with God. This has got to do with you and I. And my, if I keep up, if I make a promise to you, I must fulfill the promise. Mm -hmm. If I, uh, I don't want, I shouldn't lie to you. Uh, I shouldn't hurt you. Now, that's. That's what dharma really is all about. You know, you've described uh, secularists as statists, and you have called, in a sense, for the privatization of religion. What do you mean by the privatization uh, of religion? Well, actually, that was not my word. It was Outlook's <laughs> uh, <laughs> headline. Uh, my concern, Rajiv, is actually that both the, the sectarians and the secularists, secularists in mm -hmm. quotes, have kind of let us down. And that's why we don't respect either. That, I mean, secularism is the most wonderful idea uh, of tolerance, 
you know, Ashoka, the greatest emperor of our, who was on this uh, earth, you know, he uh, talked about, uh, and that was his notion of dharma too. So the the point I'm just saying is the secularists have let us down because they have uh, created a, a, a kind of intolerance of their own, uh, in, and 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 the reason is that most of them really make you believe that if you are religious, you are really kind of stupid. <laughs> 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 they don't mean to, mm -hmm. but this is how it comes out. And, and, and you know, I mean, I was to tell you a little story that when I was reading uh, the Mahabharat and, and it was your reaction just now <laughs> about what you said about Dharma. <laughs> Somebody, I, the guy, you know, he said to me, I haven't seen you. And I said, well, you know, I've been reading books and classic ancient books and so on. And I've been reading the Mahabharat. And he said, Cha, Hindutva ban gya. <laughs> now, that was the reaction of this secularist person to my reading the Mahabharat. In a sense, I felt suddenly that I had lost my own tradition. I had lost my own tradition because somebody thought that if I read, it's like you said, oh, you're reading about dharma, isn't that dangerous in a secular democracy? I mean, how can you give up your own <laughs> tradition? I didn't say if you're reading the dharma, if you're preaching uh, yeah, but the even dharma if as is widely uh, yeah, but understood and appreciated. Anyway, the point though is that the environment created, I think the fault is that of the both sides, the sectarians, the RSS and all these people because of the way they have tried to take over our past. But it's also the fault of the secularists, sec secularists because they have devalued secularism so that nobody listens to them. Tell me that you know much of uh, you know your writing and, and, and the things that you're engaged in the public domain are looking at, 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 at societal aspirations, the aspiration for India. Uh, what aspiration, what personal aspiration do you have for yourself? Well, I, you know, I really uh, feel I've kind of, uh, I don't have any more uh, real aspirations in the sense that I feel they're so linked up with the country that just to see the prosperity and the success of the country is quite enough, I mean, for me. Good, Sharon uh, Das. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a wonderful aspiration. Thank you very much indeed. This has been a great privilege. Thanks.